Here are the best glute exercises for building a bigger butt according to the science. Welcome back, Dr. Milo Wolf here, PhD in sports science and proud owner of Buns of Steel. People are always asking about Dr. Milo, how big are your arms? How many inches? First of all, that's confidential information. And second of all, how big are your glutes should be the real question. And before you answer, I would like you to try these glute exercises. What makes a glute exercise any good for muscle growth? The exact same things that make any exercise good for muscle growth in general. There are principles to this stuff. First, for an exercise to even target a muscle, we need to make sure it targets one of the functions of that muscle. Importantly, and this is something we'll come back to throughout the video, there are a few different muscles within the glutes that have different functions. And so knowing those functions does inform how we should train. Knowledge is power, baby. Second, the target muscle group should be the limiting factor, or at least we want to maximize the chance of it being that way. What this means is that a lot of hamstring movements or hip hinges are very solid glute exercises, but do run the risk of not having your glutes be the limiting factor, reducing its stimulus for hypertrophy a little bit for the glutes. For example, when you're doing a strict RDL with your knees relatively extended, you may find that your hamstrings are more likely to be the limiting factor compared to the glutes. Whereas if you allow your knees to bend a little bit, all of a sudden your glutes can become more involved. And by the way, that's what makes the hip thrust a decent exercise for glute building, even though it has other shortcomings. It just focuses so heavily on pure hip extension that the glutes will be taken close to failure. Next, and this is one of the shortcomings of the hip thrust, is that the exercise we pick should be stretch friendly if we want to maximize muscle growth. What does that mean? Well, pull up the stretch friendly checklist. There's three things to keep in mind here. First, the movements we pick should fully lengthen the glutes. That means that exercises that don't get your glutes fully lengthened because other muscles get fully lengthened first. Like for example, an RDL with your knees back or a good morning with your knees back. By keeping your knees back, you're likely going to have your hamstrings reach maximum length before your glutes do. And so you're fully lengthening the hamstrings, but at the expense of not getting a full stretch in your glutes. So for an exercise to be optimal for hypertrophy, we likely want to pick an exercise that allows your glutes to be fully stretched. Next, we want a decent amount of tension in a position. And this is where the glute kickback machine, as many machines are built at least, kind of falls behind a little bit. There's often not very much tension in the stretch position compared to how difficult it is near lockout. And by and large, the same applies to hip thrusts. There's a very old video around on the internet of me hip thrusting 650 pounds with relatively poor technique back when I was 18. And one thing you notice in those videos is that the lift really only gets hard near lockout when the glutes are fully shortened. For hypertrophy, that's not great. And that's part of the reason I haven't done hip thrusts in quite a long time at this point. The third factor in the stretch from the checklist is making sure the exercise is length and partial friendly. By performing length and partials, which is a technique that's been studied a few times in the literature now, you're able to circumvent these issues a little bit. Too much resistance in the shortened position? Just stop doing it and you've resolved that issue. So getting a good stretch during the exercise, having plenty of tension there, and ideally also being length and partial friendly, are probably going to be good things for muscle growth. And based on the available research, you might see an additional 5-10% to of the hypertrophy compared to just doing full range of motion if you did partials. An additional consideration and exercise selection that doesn't apply too heavily to glute training is being actually loaded versus non-actually loaded. Most glute exercises, unfortunately, will have you placing some load on your lower back. All else being equal, we would want to avoid this as it does nothing to increase glute stimulus, but does increase fatigue overall. But with glute training, unfortunately, most movements involve hip extension. Most movements involving hip extension also involve your lower back. A couple of bonus points to consider depending on your circumstances. One, how time efficient is the movement? Certain exercises are more time efficient than others. For example, stack loaded machines, dumbbell work, those are going to be a lot more time efficient on account of not needing to load up the bar, get in position, etc. It's essentially plug and play. And the second factor is micro loadability. Ideally, the exercise we pick should be easy to adjust in small increments relative to how much weight you're using. Or alternatively, you could just run a double progression or just add reps week to week. That's why this isn't such a huge factor. All right, that's the checklist for what makes an exercise maximally effective for hypertrophy. But you'll notice I mentioned the glutes functions and the fact that there's different muscle groups within the glutes that we want to train differently. To understand how we would actually go about training these, we need to understand the anatomy and the functions of the glutes. By and large, there's two groups of muscles within the glutes that we need to worry about. The first one is just the gluteus maximus, by far the biggest muscle that makes up the butt musculature. The second group of muscles we need to worry about 
about, I would categorize as glute medius and minimus. The reason these are two separate groups is because while the gluteus maximus is involved in hip extension, the gluteus minimus and medius are not. And so if we were to just do one hip extension compound exercise, we wouldn't be training the gluteus medius and minimus. And if you want your biggest butt, you're gonna have to train those as well. Instead, the gluteus medius and minimus are responsible for hip abduction mostly. As a corollary of these anatomy facts that you've just learned, we would need at least two exercises in your program to maximize overall glute hypertrophy. One compound hip extension exercise and one hip abduction exercise for the gluteus medius and minimus. One other thing to be aware of is that the gluteus maximus is also actually involved in hip abduction. But because it's also involved in hip extension, if we bend the hip or lean forward, we are further lengthening the gluteus max. And so whenever you're doing any hip abduction exercise, leaning forward further lengthens the gluteus maximus and likely would lead to more muscle growth. So leaning forward on all of your hip abduction movements is probably a good idea if your aim is to maximize overall growth of the glutes. Now, I hear you say it. All right, Dr. Milo paid off that big, long muscle length. You know, people are seething on social media nowadays about me communicating my PhD. Dr. I have to go now. Please, thank you. Ron Solo. Hello, Tom. I want to help you with your assistant search. Do you actually have any evidence for lengthened training being beneficial in the glutes? Turns out we do. We have three studies in the glutes that I can think of. The first is a study by Kubo and colleagues where they compared the half squat to a deeper squat. In the half squat group, participants squatted down to about 90 degrees of knee flexion. In the full squat group, full squat in quotation marks, they squat to about 140 degrees of knee flexion. It's not an astagrass squat, but it is a pretty deep squat. And as far as the glutes went, they observed three times as much hypertrophy in the deeper squat group compared to the more shallow squat group. So this study suggests that at least in the squat, training your glutes at lower muscle lengths is beneficial for muscle growth. Second, we have a study that has not yet been published by my own colleagues in the multi-hip machine exercise. As a quick note, while this has only been presented at the conference, I have spoken to the authors personally. This is a research group that's been involved in two prior studies on range of motion already, and so I do think the results are relevant. They compared doing length and partials, so essentially just the stretched half of the rep, to doing a full range of motion on the single leg multi-hip machine. They measured hypertrophy of the hamstrings and of the glutes via MRI, which is a very solid measurement method. And to make a long story short, they observed twice as much hypertrophy of the gluteus maximus when doing lengthened partials or focusing on stretch position on the multi-hip machine, compared to using a full range of motion. Importantly, the multi-hip exercise is kind of similar to an RDL. Your knees are relatively extended and you're essentially just performing hip extension. And so in both the squat and RDL or hip hinge type movements, it does seem like training in the stretch position leads to more growth compared to training in a more shortened position. The final study I want to mention actually slightly goes against what I just mentioned, and that's a study by Plotkin and colleagues. In this study, they compared growth in the glutes and a variety of lower body muscles and participants either doing just the squat exercise or just the hip thrust exercise. They found a couple of things. One, neither the squat nor the hip thrust was really that good at hypertrophying the upper glutes, suggesting that you can't get away with just doing one of these exercises or even both if you're able to hypertrophy the whole glute, including the upper glute. The second thing they found was that hypertrophy of the glutes was very, very similar between the squat group and the hip thrust group. So does that mean the squat actually isn't better than the hip thrust for glutes? Well, not so fast. For one, although the authors did their best to make participants squat deep, the average squat depth still wasn't that deep. And so the average muscle length involved between the squat and the hip thrust group might not have been all of that different. However, what this study does kind of suggest is that longer muscle lengths or a stretch isn't everything. And I've tried to make a point of this throughout this channel's existence repeatedly. We're not expecting a huge difference by focusing on stretch. We're expecting potentially like a 10% improvement in your growth. And alongside the squat group not really getting that deep of a stretch, I think that the fact that the hip thrust group essentially focused heavily on the glutes. In the hip thrust, there's just not many other muscle groups that could give out first before the glutes do. And so ideally, we want to pick movements where the glutes are likely to be a limiting factor, but also you get a solid stretch. And so, Based on these three studies in the glutes, and based on all the criteria that generally make an exercise effective for hypertrophy 
here are my picks. I'll pick an exercise both for compound hip extension movements for the gluteus maximus and for isolation movements in the link hip adduction for the gluteus medius minimus and also maximus. You need both in your program to maximize glute hypertrophy. I'll give you a few options for each category. Without further ado, I think the best compound exercise for the gluteus maximus is the squat, the split squat, and the high stance leg press. Let me break down why each one is beneficial. First, let's see what they have in common. Provided you go sufficiently deep and you're able to, you'll get a good stretch of all of these movements. They all have plenty of tension in that lengthened position. Depending on the leg press you're using, but they are also length and partial friendly. They're all reasonably stable, but here's what sets one apart from the other. First, for the ass to grass squat, and by the way, I would recommend if you're going to do partials to do these on a Smith machine, just for safety, there's a few things that are advantageous. It's a pretty stable exercise. If you can go deep, you can get a deep stretch in your glutes. We have tested a more shallow squat to a more deep squat in the glutes and found more hypertrophy. So it does seem to be an efficacious exercise for growing the glutes in general. And importantly, a line of research in Powell of those actually suggests that in the squat, the muscle groups most likely to fail first are going to be the glutes and adductors or the hip extensors more broadly. And so the squat also successfully checks off that criteria of having the glutes be the limiting factor or very close to it. In a similar vein, we have the split squat. Again, I personally like the Smith machine for these just because you can re rack the weight at any point. Should you fail, it's more stable. You're not going to end the set just because you fell over with a pair of dumbbells. While you do need to train your two legs separately, it has the advantage of requiring far less load, which has two distinct benefits. One, in my experience, it takes less time to warm up for. And two, it loads the lower back to a lesser extent, which is generally a good thing when we want to make sure we're minimizing fatigue and making sure the glutes are a limiting factor. And it's also a good thing, potentially, if you're dealing with some lower back pain overall, you may find not a strong enforcement. You may find that you can tolerate them more easily. The high stance leg press or the high foot placement leg press has similar benefits. One, minimal spinal loading. Two, for the glutes, the leg press is actually already a length and partial. When you're starting leg press, your hips are typically bent to about 90 degrees of hip flexion already. And then, if you go sufficiently deep with a high foot placement, you're fully lengthening the glute maximus. And so, without even needing to do specifically lengthened partials, you are essentially going through just about half the range of motion of the glute max, and specifically, the more stretched half. Which, going by the research, is probably a good thing for muscle growth. And in general, you could actually make the argument that because of the like presses a length and partial for the glutes, it's actually a better glute movement, all else being equal, than a quad movement. And finally, I wanted to mention this, the hip thrust isn't a bad exercise if all you want is glute growth. It's highly specific, by just having hip extension be involved, there's not really many other muscle groups that could give out first, but in my view, training the glutes in the more length of position is broadly speaking going to be better for hypertrophy compared to the hip thrust. And as far as the best glute medius minimus isolation exercise goes, here are my two picks. One, the hip abduction machine, and two, the ankle cuff sidestep. The hip abduction machine does actually also involve your gluteus maximus because it's involved in abduction. And so by leaning forward during that exercise, you're actually lengthening the gluteus maximus more and potentially leading to more hypertrophy of the glute max and your glutes overall. In my experience, it's also a bit more stable than the ankle cuff sidestep. It's a bit more available. Most gyms, almost all gyms have this, whereas fewer gyms I think have an ankle cuff, although you can purchase that. And finally, it is bilateral. However, all else being equal, it is going to be providing less of a stretch on the gluteus medius and minimus than the ankle cuffed sidestep. While the ankle cuffed sidestep provides a better stretch on the gluteus medius and minimus, it likely won't involve your gluteus maximus as much on account of the movement pattern involved. Indeed, it's a bit closer to transverse abduction than pure abduction. Equally, with the ankle cuffed sidestep, you will need to do both legs separately, which can take a bit more time. But it is functionally like from partial, allows you to get a deeper stretch on your gluteus medius and minimus. So if all you cared about was the gluteus medius and minimus hypertrophy, no matter the time constraint, then I think it might be the better option. And by the way, shout out to Brett Contreras for suggesting this exercise. Let me give you a few takeaways. The same principles of exercise selection apply to any muscle group. Importantly, for the glutes, we also have studies broadly lending credence to these principles as far as the glutes go. And so, as a result of all of these considerations, I think squats, split squats, and the high stance leg press are your best compound glute exercises. Conversely, your best gluteus medius and minimus isolation exercises, I think, are the machine abduction, 
and the ankle cuff side step. That is the video, broke down a ton of glute science for you guys. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a comment, like down below, subscribe to the channel. If there's any topics you'd like to see me cover, leave a comment down below and I will get to it. If you'd like me to coach you, consider checking out the link above. And in the meantime, have a phenomenal day and I'll see you guys, my subscribers, in that next one. Peace. I love being an editor, but there are a few things I miss. Silence, the absence of noise, one single moment undisturbed by the sound of Dr. Milo Wolf and his long muscle length nonsense. There is no quiet anymore. There is only length and partials. Now you might be asking, why would length and partials be better for muscle growth?